I want to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we are meeting. Tonight, we are hearing from a panel of young leaders, advocates, and quite likely some of the people who will one day run this country. We'll ask them, does AI belong in the classroom? Was it right to cancel the Commonwealth Games? And how old is too old to vote? Joining our panel, Birupai Waramai woman and First Nations advocate, Amali Bron. Founder and chief anchor of Six News, Leo Puglisi. Activist, speaker, poet and actor, Aud Mason Hyde. Founder of Nuclear for Australia, Will Shackle. New South Wales Youth Parliament representative Laura Strawbridge and Minister for Youth and Early Childhood Education Anne Arley. Welcome to this high school special of Q&A. Behind the news, but tonight BTN High is teaming up with Q&A to bring you this very special episode, tackling the biggest issues affecting young Australians. And the conversation will be driven by our audience, which is made up entirely of high school students. You would have heard them just then. <laughs> For those of you streaming us on iView and on socials, Quanda is the hashtag, so make sure you get involved. To get us started tonight, here is a question from Amy Parcell. Hi guys, my question is, with the rise of artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT and their use in the workplace and school, do you think there's sufficient legislation and policies to prevent their misuse? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm going to throw this one to Leo. Get us started, Leo. What do you think about AI? Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of inevitable. It's going to be used in the classroom and you can have legislation, you can have the government say we're going to put in a ban, but whether it's going to work or not, I mean, it remains to be seen. And I, mean, I hope I'm not, my teachers aren't watching, but I can, I can kind of attest to the fact that uh, those bans don't work. And in terms of legislation, uh, trying to legislate pretty much anything relating to online activity, especially something to AI, I mean, that's going to be a huge challenge for any government, state or federal. Um, and so, in terms of it being sufficient for those who are actually wanting to stop AI and its misuse in the classroom, um, it's probably not there. But again, that's probably because it's just so incredibly hard to um, try to get that done. Uh, inevitably, I'm sure we're going to see more governments try to put in action. Um, but it's just such an issue, uh, well, su such a thing where it's so hard to get any kind of, of um, you know, proper ban or block on it. Um, so as much as the government can put in things, I just don't think it's going to work that much. Do you ever use ChatGPT because you create the news every single day uh, on your channel? Do you ever use ChatGPT to write anything, Leo? I've used it out of, out of pure interest and pure research, um, which is, I guess, the other thing because it's not fully accurate and that, that's an incredibly hard thing to do. Uh, obviously it's continuing to evolve just like with ChatGPT as you mentioned, um, but it's never going to be as fully accurate as maybe um, the, a human actually going and researching something uh, can, can find for themselves. Never? Oh, it's a big call. Cool. You never know what the future will hold. <laughs> at this stage at least. <laughs> well, Laura, I know, Laura, you have actually used ChatGP, GPT quite yep. regularly yes. to help you with your Year 12 schoolwork. Yes, yeah, so artificial intelligence is so powerful. We know it's here to stay, so schools should learn to embrace it rather than try and eliminate it. Within my school community, we've seen how um, effective it can be in enhancing our learning. So, for example, I can ask uh, ChatGPT to um, mark some of my work and imagine that the bot is the teacher. So it can give me feedback, it can uh, help me improve on my work. Is there an um, example of something that you've used it for recently? Yeah, like so um, I was practising for my legal studies trials and I submitted one of my draft essays and I asked it to mark as if it's a Year 12 legal studies <coughs> teacher and to be super critical. 
So it analysed my essay, um, gave me a mark. I was pretty happy with it. Um, and just also some feedback as well. So I think it can be really beneficial in the classroom. Did you feel like that was ethical or did you, did you feel it all a little bit weird, like you were getting some advantage over other students that might not be using that? Well, um, I think uh, obviously ChatGPT is available on the internet so anyone can and a lot of people in my class are actually encouraging each other to use it because it's this extra tool to further enhance our learning. Well, Anne, I have to ask you because obviously this is also, this question is very much about legislation. Uh, do you think the government has missed the boat a bit with this? You know, have, should we have been acting on this even sooner than now and how long might it take now for us to be legislating this sort of I thing? I think in the, the rapid way that technology evolves, it would be very difficult to create legislation that um, kind of looks forward uh, and, and captures everything that's going to come forward. I do want to pick up, though, on the issue of ethics because I do think that we need to have an ethical framework around the development of technology. Um, you know, we all know that technology can be used for good and it can be used for bad. In terms of its incorporation in the classroom, I think that, you know, the, the, the example that you gave, Laura, another example would be teachers can ask students to, um, you know, use the, the AI to do an essay and then the student or the class together um, analyzes that and looks at you know where does it where is it human where is it yeah. non-human where what were the sources of it but i do think that it's it is Right now, we have, we're at a situation where technology is so rapidly changing and we don't have the legislative framework around social media, for example. We don't have a legislative framework around technology. But we need to go back to the ethical framework. An ethical framework around technology, I think, is where we need to focus our attentions. Last time you were on this program, you talked about what you'd used ChatGPT yeah. for. I don't know if you remember this, but I you do. said you how had could written. I how could you forget? You said you had written a, I think it was a love poem to your, yes, your it was my husband. Anniversary. It was a Valentine's Day message <laughs> to my ever so romantic husband, <laughs> because I am so not romantic, <laughs> and it was a, so. It was a really boring Valentine's. Day message like literally you could have picked up a, a Hallmark card and found something better. Have you tried have you tried to use it for anything since? No. That um, was it. I, um, <laughs> I, I like to rely on human creativity. <laughs> well speaking of creativity, Ord, I've got to ask you a question because you are a very creative person, you're a poet, you're an actor. When it comes to artificial intelligence, is that something that you are worried about in that space? I think uh, it's a really interesting point because we're seeing it play out a little bit in the US right now with the writers uh, and actors strike. I think the thing we maybe need to be worried about is again how um, people with bad interests use it against creatives. Uh, like we're seeing it being written into contracts and the idea that you can kind of replicate someone's image uh, forever. Um, from one day of work and they only get paid for that day of work. So you're and sort of referring to the Hollywood writers' yeah, strike? Yeah, yes. the writers' strike yeah, and yeah, the actors' the strike in Hollywood there, right now. Strike, yep. um, and I think what we really need to be focused on is in general kind of trying to uphold those ethics of um, not, you know, when possible, not allowing it to take over real human jobs that genuinely cannot be done by AI. Um, and also using it for purposes, I think the classroom's a really interesting um, context for this, but like just thinking about how it could be used well, um, you know, essay structures that are given to students at the start of the year are not something that a teacher needs to put a whole lot of creativity into necessarily. They're fairly stock standard. Um, and, and using AI for things like that seems like a very interesting case um, to take away a workload off of a person mm. rather than... Uh, and, and make their job easier rather than taking their entire job So everyone away. seems to be very happy for it to be used by teachers, <laughs> at the least, <laughs> so if you're listening, teachers. <laughs> All right, on to the next question. Let's hear from Sarah Bandanin. Um, hi. Um, many students, despite the laws banning schools and um, phones in schools, still use their phone for not only games and social media, but communication, healthcare services, accessing Wi-Fi and education. Do you think students should be taught about this technology and should um, students be able to use their phones at, at school? I'm going to throw this one over to you, Amali. What do you think about that? Well, from my experiences um, at school, in the junior school and like in the secondary school, 
kids aren't meant to have their phone on them during the day, so we just mm -hmm. keep them in our lockers and everything, which is fine. But um, once you get into year 11 and 12, you're allowed to have them around, which is kind of fine because um, the only reason why you'd really use it in our classrooms or anything is for educational purposes. So um, I haven't had any issues with that, but I know... And this from is just home. your school particularly yeah, that yeah, has yeah. that rule, yeah. yeah. But I know from home, um, from Tari, where I'm from, they there's a rule at one school, I think, where they like have their phones, they take their phones at the start of the day and put them in pockets. So yes. they aren't, like, they don't let, is that what you were talking about, how they don't let them? I have seen yeah. those. Uh, I'm sure some people in our audience have seen them. Yeah, I've got some nods. Yeah, so they are actually phone pouches. Yeah. You put your phone yes. in, you lock it up. Do we think that's a good idea? I think it can be beneficial. I mean, it's kind of... It seems quite controlling in a way, so that's kind of the hard part about it. But I think, I mean, to concentrate and to get the best out of your school and learning experience, I think it could be beneficial. But yeah, it seems quite controlling in a way. Will, what do you think? I feel like you have an opinion on this. Well, yes, I, I don't have the benefit of hindsight. I go to a school which has a phone ban and that's been successfully reinforced and um, regulated in our school. So I don't, I don't know about how it's reinforced and how it's regulated in other schools, but. I, I very strongly believe that phones should be banned in schools and I support the moves that the Queensland Government and the New South Wales Government has taken to do that. Um, and that's for a few reasons. I think, first of all, w when you're in the classroom, your primary focus should be on your education. I don't actually think that a phone can enhance your education and your outcomes in school. Look, I don't have the benefit of hindsight, so you may disagree. And the other, there's a few other issues in terms of how it may potentially exacerbate incidents and the effects of cyberbullying. And also, I think, for me, I obviously don't go to a school which has phones and you're allowed to use phones, but I think it's just good having six hours a day, each weekday, where we are free of the chaos of the outside world, not having to be exposed to it on our phones. And I think that it's really good to have that moment in school where we can just focus on our education and escape from this, what is sometimes a really overwhelming world around us. That's my personal opinion. Um, so, I, yeah. Will is well, we should just say uh, it's a few more states. So it's Victoria, WA, SA, Tasmania and the NT have bans for state schools. And what's your take on this? Yeah, well, you're, you're right there. Pretty much every state, um, and not necessarily a ban, but they're looking at managing <coughs> mobile phone use in schools. I do recognise that for some um, students, particularly those with, for example, continuous glucose monitors, yeah. they need to have mm -hmm. their phones on them for health purposes. And I think that that's included in how we manage um, mobile use in schools. But for example, in places where they have, or schools where they have um, you know, managed the, the use of mobile phones in schools, what they've found and what I've heard from them is that they've found that during lunch breaks and and um, and breaks, um, what are they called again, um, recess mm. breaks, um, that young people are actually going out... It's there. been a while, know, it's OK, it's we understand. <laughs> I don't even get a lunch break or a recess break anymore. Um, that, you know, they're actually interacting with each other, they're actually, you know, doing physical sport and they're learning how to interact with each other again. I remember talking to some young people and we were talking about, um, you know, after COVID, one of the things they were saying to me was that the impact of COVID on their mental health, but also the impact of COVID on their social skills and that going out and actually talking and interacting with people face to face was was something that they were finding challenging so in this particular instance when they removed the mobile phones during lunch and recess they found that the young people the young students were interacting with each other so I think you know, as, you know there are times when you should manage it um, sometimes you know, states will take or schools will take um, um, a decision to ban it or manage it but there will always be cases where some people will need to have their phones with them, especially for health mm -hmm. reasons. Mm. OK, and this brings us to our online poll. We're asking school students, should mobile phones be banned in all high schools? You can cast your votes anonymously on the Q&A Facebook, Twitter and YouTube accounts or the ABC News Instagram account. We'll bring you all the results later. All right, plenty to get to tonight. I'd mm. like to bring in Alison Yeo. From Snapchat to Twitter to Instagram and TikTok, Social media platforms are being misused to the point that they are toxic, especially to the younger generation. Do you think social media is ruining us? And how can we prevent the disruptive aspects of social media in the future? It wouldn't be a room of Gen Zs if we didn't talk about social media, so I'm glad you raised that. Um, Ord, I'm putting this to you because I know you've had some difficult experiences. Yeah, um, I think 
social media is is like a lot of our online spaces, but also just it, it is a public <coughs> space that we all exist in. Um, it's just one that we haven't existed in for very long. Um, and, and it's also so vast. And, and I, as a trans person, what I've, uh, the issues I've had is a lot of hate speech. Um, and it's a real problem online. Uh, a lot of times the, the suggestion is, oh, just don't look, don't go on social media. And I do, I, I see that myself as a limitation. Why should I, as um, say a victim in a certain situation, have to stop the use of something, stop my experience in a public space, whether it's virtual or in person, um, because of other people? And so I think there's a lot of. <laughs> I think social media is like just vastly undiscovered um, and, and unregulated and there's a lot of work to be done there. I think there are also models that have really worked. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, platforms which are doing a really good job of content moderation, a really good job of safety features or at least going that way. Um, and so I think it's more of a question of what we decide the line is and whether the government takes a, a stand on that. Mm. Um, and I think that there's work to be done there. I'm not sure what that is. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, again, it's kind of like the use of phones in schools. I, I do think that these things are an integral part of how we are all going to function for the foreseeable future. And so I'm not sure that just removing them from our environments for a certain period of time is the right thing to do. Um, <laughs> I think teaching the next generation how to use these things safely and also how to respect each other in these spaces mm -hmm. is the better thing to do. Mm -hmm. Or you have had some pretty bad experiences just recently, if you're happy to talk about yeah, it. Absolutely. Do you want to tell us? It was just this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah. this week, um, the announcement of this show uh, and my involvement with it. And, and a lot of people uh, not de deciding they wouldn't watch the show um, purely because I was a trans person who's here their loss. on the show. That's right, it's their loss, I their think. Loss. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the notion that like any person, because of one aspect of who they are, I mean, I mean it's a big aspect of who I am, but because of one part of their identity shouldn't be listened to um, in any case is, is just abhorrent and wrong. Leo. <laughs> So, Leo, you have a whole lot of followers. You are predominantly, you're online, you're very popular online. What's your experience with social media as, as like a positive sort of thing for you? Yeah, I mean, obviously I can't discount your experience and I mean, I've also had terrible experiences online with some comments. I try mostly to ignore them or just mock them. Um, but at the, same, <laughs> at the same time, it's, I'm not always going to bag social media because uh, I wouldn't be where I am with Six News without um, social media. You know, social media is an integral part. And again, um, when it comes down to uh, younger people and their interactions on it, and like with phone bans or phone not bans, um, it, it comes down to uh, teaching, it comes down to education on that. Um, and so in terms of social media positives, though, look, I, it, as I said, got me where I am. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's again, a tough you know, line for a government to cross whether they want to get into, like with, again, like with ChatGPT, the, the moderation of something that is just so vast and so hard to moderate and always constantly growing and expanding and uh, evolving. That is something incredibly hard for any government um, to uh, moderate at all. Mm -hmm. If I may add something, I think... Please. Look, Ord, obviously you've been through some terrible stuff and we're all going to be subjected to some terrible and repugnant vile comments after this. And I, I, I've also received those, to be very honest, and I think it's a shame that when young people advocate for issues they care about, that this is just the inevitable fate of doing, doing that. I think there is a solution and I do not understand why people are still allowed to be anonymous on social media. There's a reason why there's not, like, abuse and personal attacks on sites like LinkedIn. It's because people's professional reputations... <laughs> I know it's a joke, but people's prof professional reputations, they'll lose their job if they make a comment, if they attack someone like that. 
And I think that there needs to be consequences for those people. Clearly, moderation isn't working at the moment. I, yeah, I've had terrible things. I've been called all sorts of names. I get them reported to, and nothing's done about it. I know there's organisations like eSafety, but I think a serious step we should consider is removing people's ability to hide behind, you know, a random username or a random profile picture because they need to be accountable for what they say and the attacks that they make against us. to ask you, obviously, after that, like, is that something that you think that the government should be considering looking into more than they have in the past? Mm. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say to Ord, um, mm. I think you've got the right attitude um, for the haters. I, myself, <laughs> have copped um, a lot of racism online, and I do want to acknowledge right now with um, the debate on The Voice happening that it has gotten absolutely unbearable mm. on um, a lot of... I've had to put out a statement on my social social media feed about the racism that's coming through, mm. the fact that people <coughs> think that they can say things online and have no consequences, you're absolutely right, mm. that they do have consequences. I went to court in February over somebody who sent me a death threat oh. online because he hated my religious faith um, and didn't like who I was. So there are consequences and there are pathways that you can take if it gets to that dangerous point but, as well. But what is the government doing? So we have at the moment, there's a draft bill out around mis and it's primarily around misinformation and disinformation. It is so very difficult to regulate this because it is in the hands primarily of the social media companies. Mm. And whilst they do have policies where they take down things, there also is a kind of futility to the whack-a-mole kind of model where you take something down and ten more grow in its place. It's like when you pluck a grey hair, which none of you will have to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, know, you, you take something down and ten more grow in its place. Can I give you a solution, though, that I think works? Because I used to do this before before I became a Member of Parliament, I had a not-for-profit that was youth-oriented. And one of the things that I did was we developed young people, like the young people here, like all of you, to become content creators and to fight hatred and to fight online um, bullying and to fight it all yourself. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you all have agency and you all have power to change it by, by becoming content creators yourself, just as like many of you have done, and getting out there and refuting the misinformation and the disinformation that comes out there. Put out a counter-narrative. Don't let hate win. Like, don't let that... We could, we could all talk about this forever, I'm sure. And I just want to say thank you so much Can for... Can I just say one thing? Of course, I apologise. I, um, I think that's a really interesting point. And I know it's a really tricky field. Yeah. And I also think, in an ideal world, um, for people who are generally going to be the targets of, of hate speech, bullying, um, vilification online, people who, ha who are um, marginalised groups included in vilification and anti-discrimination acts, ideally there would be support. Um, on a governmental level, uh, maybe uh, a regulation for the for social media companies. I don't know how it looks, but I do think that in an ideal world, the, the burden of that is not on the individuals using the platforms or the individuals copying that abuse. No, I agree with you on that. Mm. And there are stuff around abhorrent content. There are laws around yes. abhorrent content, abhorrent material that we do... We have set mm. up the e-safety commissioner. Mm. Uh, mm. But ultimately, who polices this mm. is the social media companies. OK, we do need to move on. We do need to move on. OK, <laughs> if this discussion is raising any difficulties for you or anyone you know, please make sure you talk to someone about it and don't forget you can always reach out to Lifeline, mm. QLife or the Kids Helpline. It's really important to speak to somebody. All right, now I'd like to bring in Fadzi Bako. Fadzi, you have a question on hex debts, but can you also tell us a little bit about yourself because there's a backstory here. Yes. So uh, my name is Fadzi Bako. Um, my dad is from South Sudan and my mum is from Zimbabwe. And um, this question came about with a conversation with my mum and we're talking about her hex debt. And my mum is in her late 30s now and she's still paying off her hex debt from her 20s. So then it, um, this opportunity arose and I decided to ask about hex debts for people of colour in Australia. Because, you know, a lot of immigrant parents say, you know, I'm going to move here so my kid can have a better life. And then their kid grows up and they go to uni and then they're followed by the shadow of hex for the rest of their lives and they're still paying off, you know, something that's supposed to help them, you know, uni or um, 
higher education. So my question is, how do we make sure that people of colour are not followed, followed by this um, shadow for the rest of their lives? Because I know I want to go to uni and it'll be the worst thing ever to see I can't pursue my dreams or someone else can't pursue their dreams because um, I don't have enough money. Thank you, Fadzi. And I'm putting this one to you. Yeah, I was in my late 30s when I finally paid off my hex debt too. So I, I feel, I feel, I feel what your mum um, has um, is feeling as well. Look, I think hex debt was in, or hex, uh, which we now call help, was introduced to actually increase the number of people who had the capacity to go to university by introducing a way in which they could repay their fees post <coughs> um, post graduation. We're currently doing a review of the universities. It's called the University Accord. They delivered their um, interim report today, and in fact, mm -hmm. the Minister for Education, Minister Jason Clare, gave a press club speech about it. If you're all interested, you can have a look at that. And that includes a review of, of help, of, of HEX or help. Um, but there is also a focus in there on looking at the cohorts that don't traditionally or haven't been, have been locked out of university, particularly and first and foremost, First Nations young people um, who have the, some, the, the lowest um, uh, uh, university graduation rates, but also other vulnerable cohorts, cohorts as well. And I know that the Minister is absolutely absolutely dedicated to ensuring that um, everyone in Australia has the opportunity to go to university and extending that to, and I identify as a person of colour as well, to people of colour, to our First Nations um, and to people from low so lower socioeconomic backgrounds as well. So that review will be delivered uh, I think in another six months' time. But the interim report has a lot to say about help debt, about university and making university more accessible to everyone. Do you Please. Do you think it's uh, the university's fault for not making, you know, their courses accessible to everyone? Oh, look, that's a that's a that's a, a good question, and it's a complex question because I don't think it's we can lay blame um, at any particular. Thing. The fact is that in this country, if you do come from a poorer background or from a marginalised group, you are less likely to go to university. Um, and if you're um, a First Nations young man, you're more likely to end up in jail than at university. And I think that's a great shame on this country. Um, and so I, I, I would be loath to kind of lay the blame at just one group or one person. I do think there is structural reform and change that's needed. And I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to achieve that. <laughs> Molly, you are a First Nations woman. You come from Tari, Mid-North, New South Wales coast. Pretty nice spot. <laughs> Um, so what are your experiences? Because you've obviously had to, you know, you're, you're going to consider, I suppose, moving away and, mm -hmm. and you already live in Sydney? Yeah, I board. Um, I yes. go to boarding school in Sydney. Yeah. Yes. So what are your, what are you, your thoughts when it comes to university? Well, um, I'm, on a, I'm on a scholarship at my school, so I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be able to go to my school if I wasn't on that scholarship. And I started in Year 9. So um, I've talked a lot about it and I really want to go to university because, you know, it just gives you better opportunities and more just, like, you have the ability to make more decisions and have more options in life. So um, that's a goal for me. I'd really love to go to university. Um, and um, I think they are making it a lot better with having more First Nations scholarships because um, I've had a lot of discussions about it and with applying, you know, to those scholarships. So there is a lot... Um, there's a lot going on to try and help with the disparities, I guess, in um, allowing all groups and marginalised groups to be able to go to university. So for me, there are things that are being put in place, but yeah, it's still really difficult. And do you think it's a, yeah? Do you think yeah. it's enough? What's being well, done is enough in your opinion? It's hard to say because um, if I was at home, if I was still living where I was, probably wouldn't have graduated high school. So you know, it's a big step for me to be in Sydney, but I can't imagine having the motivation from where I was living to attend a university because it just would have been too hard and too much. What's like not. It would have been too hard on my family, I think, and I wouldn't want to put anyone through that. So I think, um, yeah, having the scholarship options has really made it possible. Yeah, but yeah it, it's still a still lot to happen and still a lot more to come, I think, to improve overall. Laura, you have a take on this as well, I think. Yeah, so it was very interesting looking at the HEC situation because university used to be free in Australia and uh, that did change. Um, and it's also very interesting hearing the Prime Minister's take because he did go to university for free. So um, when it comes to university, I think we have to balance between personal responsibility 
um, and then the amount of reliance that we have on the government. And I think having some sort of hex debt um, acts as sort of like an inspiration to um, get students to complete their work and gets them motivated to complete their degree. And um, do you think it yeah. makes sense for uh, university debt to be potentially higher if it, you know, eases the the debt elsewhere in in the budget? Well, um, we obviously know the budget's very tight. Um, essentially, I know there's calls um, from some parties to make university uh, free. I'm not sure if there's um, funding in that. But again, I, I personally don't believe university should be free because um, I think we should have individual responsibility when it comes to education. Okay. If you're just joining us, I'm Amelia Mosley and you are watching a Q&A high school special live with <laughs> Amali Bron, Leo Fablisi, Lord Mason Hyde, Will Shackle, Laura Strawbridge and Anne Ali. Now let's hear from Joette Collier. How do you think the voice to parliament will affect upcoming Aboriginal youth and their communities? Okay, I'm going to throw this one to you, Amali, as a First Nations woman. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, okay, so the voice and everything, it's a big debate at the moment, obviously. Um, I think the effect on youth, I know that there's lots of um, kind of negative effects coming off the end of it with ha people having different perspectives and people wanting different things, which is really hard and it's tough because that's just the society that we live in, I suppose. And people hate and, you know, do all that sort of thing. But um, for me and for my family, we... Just having something that represents us and recognises us, I think, in the um, constitution would be, would be very beneficial overall in the end. But, um, yeah, it could definitely have a negative effect on people and it could put, like, a little bit of pressure to feel a certain way, I think. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you worry about the campaigning around it? Is that something that you are thinking about when it comes to campaigning and, and will things get a bit nasty? You know, we touched on some of that earlier? Well, I mean, social media can be really awful. And yeah, there can be lots of negative aspects of it because um, you believe certain things. And that's really tough because it's, you know, I think an important part about just being like a good person is respecting other people's opinions for what they are and for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it's quite sad that we have such um, mm -hmm. bad backlash because of what you believe in. Um, and so, Joette, you have a little bit to say about your take on this as well. Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, as a um, proud Aboriginal woman from New South Wales as well, um, I, I've um, done heaps of research about the Voice to Parliament and I think that it's going to be... Um, there's more negativity gonna, um, that is going to come out of it mm -hmm. than positive. So... If, if I could vote, um, I would um, vote no. OK, yeah. Uh, all right, well, I might just ask also, Laura, you yeah. did ask a question earlier this year um, about the cost when it comes to the referendum yeah. for The Voice. So what's your view? Um, so I think that the government um, is offering this tokenistic solution to make it appear like they're help, uh, helping Indigenous Australians. Um, there's over 2,000 indigenous, indigenous advisory committees across the country and they're all pointing to uh, several issues um, such as economic participation, education and healthcare. And I fear that if this voice passes, um, the voice is going to say we need to solve these issues. So I believe that we should be addressing these issues straight up rather than creating another advisory body. Um, and linking back to um, my question on Q&A a few months ago, um, it obviously got a bit ratty um, and I didn't really get my question answered but holding the referendum is estimated to cost around half a billion dollars um, and it might not even pass, it might not be effective, it might just be tokenistic. So I believe that we should be investing those money into Indigenous um, communities through education and healthcare because that is almost guaranteed to make change and The Voice does not guarantee that. Can I just jump in? Of course you can, yeah. I saw you, I saw you nodding there, Mali. Yeah, no, go so for I it. completely agree in the sense that there needs to be more action rather than more um, advocation and more yeah. advisory committees that's going on. But um, another thing that I just get a little bit worried about is that if this doesn't pass, then what, what will be next? Like, what is next for us? Because there are... Yeah, like... Because, yeah, like, I... 
completely agree in the sense that action does need to be taken, but if the voice doesn't pass, then I don't really know what's next. Mm. And we're just, you know, going on and mm. living life and there's going to be those inequities going on without anything going on, yeah, but at least I, we can recognise yeah. it. And if I can jump in just quickly, I think it's a really interesting question because there's a lot of differing opinions on this and a lot of nuance in those opinions. It's actually not as simple as this vote means this and this means the other thing. But the, the fact of the matter is that when it comes time to vote, uh, there is a yes box and a no box. And I, having, having read some of the work um, of, of people who are signatories on the Uluru Statement from the heart, I think, you know, it's not perfect, the question that's being pitched. And also, I think that it is um, that group of people who, who came together um, at various constitutional conferences, it is them extending their hands to us as the public. And, and um, you know, as a queer person who lived through the, the plebiscite, the gay marriage plebiscite, which is a very different beast, but it was a, an incredibly challenging time to be a young queer person in Australia. Um, mm. I know that that is, you know, having an effect on, on Indigenous folk, young and old, who I know. Um, it's, a, it's a divisive time, mm. unfortunately. It shouldn't be, but it is. Um, and I think that it's really easy to fall into misinformation. And also having constitutional recognition is actually a huge step. Agreed. You know, like putting this in the constitution um, is, we, we, you know, we've seen indigenous bodies um, who are advisory councils in federal parliament before. And because of the way that our political system functions, they can be taken out, uh, they can be manipulated. Having it as a constitutional, um, Enshrined. reform enshrined yeah. in the constitution yeah. is one way to make it effective yeah yeah uh, laura yeah we yeah. do need to move on but <laughs> laura yep um i just don't believe that the government is serious about indigenous recognition in the constitution um i think having um something not exact but similar to the 1999 referendum there was a second question which was a preamble um that, re re that uh, recognized indigenous australians and i think tony abbott put it perfectly a couple months ago where he said um having a preamble in the constitution which recognises Indigenous Australians, uh, Australians that were born here and Australia's um, brilliant migrant story. I believe having a referendum for a preamble would have uh, as much support as the 1967 referendum and it would, it's, it would be almost guaranteed to pass. And as we've seen in the polls uh, just this week, the um, yes vote is approximately 41%. So I, I feel like the government uh, recognising Indigenous Australians that way would almost guarantee um, recognition in the Constitution. I'm not sure everyone agrees with you. That's I can okay. see all shaking okay. their head, but look, we do have to move on. So I'll just ask really quickly, and uh, when's the date of the referendum going to be? <laughs> we don't, we don't, on, we don't, have, a, we don't have a date set yet, Too but late. it'll be in October. And just, just to clarify, this is not a government thing. The Uluru Statement from the Heart has been a decade and a half in the making, yeah. and it, this, has, it is, this is from the First Nations people of our of Did our you just nation. say October, though? It'll be yeah. October. Well, oh, <laughs> 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 Seriously, I don't know the date. I really don't know the date. But, uh, but we have said uh, between October and December, later this year. Hmm. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, plenty to get to tonight. Here's Samuel Van Holstein. Hi. Um, should Australia introduce an age cutoff for voting, considering that elderly, elderly voters will not get to see the long-term consequences of their actions? And furthermore, should there be an age cap for politicians? Mm. <laughs> and, and space. I'm not going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put this one to Leo. What do you think, Leo? Leo, so an age cut-off for voting. We're talking older, the older you get, should you be cut off at some point? Look, I mean, I don't... Number one, I don't think that would happen. Number two, I just think, given the amount of, you know, varied views, and I get the broader consensus is that um, at this stage older people are more conservative, um, but I guess given the broader you know, the amount of, of broad views and also the fact that while there might be some people who, um, you know, aren't very politically engaged, there could be really... I, I'm sure there are politically engaged, very politically engaged people, 80, 85, 90 and older. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so to cut it off, I, I just don't think, um, you know, would be fair on them. Um, and then in regards to an age cap for politicians, I mean, I don't <laughs> know if that would have much effect because, at least in this country... 
um, politicians do seem to retire more than, say, the US, where there's, like, current <laughs> representatives in their Congress <laughs> who, are in their, who are in their 90s right now. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, 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 there's not many politicians who... Um, you know, I can't see never retiring, except uh, maybe Bob Catter. <laughs> <laughs> Will, did you have yeah. thoughts? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure about, you know, I might be open to having an age limit on politicians here in Australia, because I think we can see what's going on in the US. We need a bit of young blood in the mix. But in regards to restricting the voting of, like, everyday citizens of elderly people, what I would say is I think that elderly people, government plays a vital role in their lives, whether it's healthcare, end of life, um, government welfare, all of those services are crucial to those individuals and they should have a say in what, what they, what, whatever government is in power and the policies that ultimately will affect them quite profoundly and will affect their healthcare, will affect their livelihood and affect, quite honestly, their last years on this earth. I think it's incredibly important that we preserve and we make sure that they retain the right to vote. Yeah. Well, let's... <laughs> let's... Let's flip it a little bit, though. All right, so what about then 16-year-olds uh, who are going out to work, uh, yes. many of which I'm sure are in this room? 16-, uh, 17-year-olds, do we think then, by that same argument, that they should be able to vote? Yes. Or yes? Yes, absolutely. I think... I... <laughs> I think um, in terms of democracy as a concept, voting rights, it should be a question of how many people can we feasibly add to that right rather than how many people can we... Who are we taking it away from? I think if we have more of the population voting, that's a better thing. Um, you know, as someone who was campaigning as a school striker around elections and about policy from the time I was 14, um, I've done two election cycles without being able to vote uh, and have been very educated on, on the topics and, and the politicians to an extent that a lot of adults weren't. But I don't think that means they shouldn't get to vote. Um, I think we've, we've seen uh, the issues and the horrific drawbacks that happen when we take away anyone's voting rights or try to restrict them in any way. It's, it's not the right thing to do. If anything, I think we should move the voting age lower, absolutely. Can I, can I actually... <laughs> can I have a vote in the audience? Put your hand up if you do think that we should lower the voting age in Australia to, say, 16. <laughs> do you want to also vote in the referendum? Like, if you could, yes? yes. Yeah. 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 So that's a, a, a lot of people here. And you have mm. had this question put to you before, and I know that you sort of hosed it down, basically, that you weren't mm. that... You didn't no. think, actually, that many uh, 16, 17-year-olds were interested in this. Is this changing your mind a little? Um, not really, no, to be honest. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because I do think we need to change the conversation a little bit. This idea that voting mm. is, your, is, is the, the kind of the marker mm. of democratic and political participation, I think what we've got mm. here is a panel that demonstrates you can be politically active, well. you can make change, you can, be, you can have more impact than somebody who, who has absolutely no interest in politics and goes to the ballot box every three or four years and maybe even donkey votes. I think we've got, to, we've got to separate between the kind of formal citizenship of the right to vote and active participation and active political participation. And as... <laughs> thank you. And, and as the Minister for you... I want to ensure that I encourage, not be the voice for young people, because God knows I'm not young, but I want to ensure that young people feel that they can have political participation, feel that they can have a voice, feel that they can make a change. Look at the change the young people made when they took to the streets for climate action. It was a huge change, and many of them weren't voting young people. So I don't think that voting is a marker of the ability to change politics or change policy, or be politically active. You have so many other ways to do that, and young people are absolutely amazing at being able to, to, to do that. And that's okay. what I want to encourage. All right, let's move on. Next, we'll hear from Brendan Davies. Brendan. Recently, the CSIRO released a report concluding that nuclear energy does not currently provide an economical an economically competitive solution in Australia. In the light of this and the continual falling of renewable prices, why should we now invest in nuclear power plants that could take decades to build? 
Well, thank you for your question. Will knew this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought Don't it was teamed, to be honest. Um, but, and thank you for your question. What I would first say about the Gen Cost report is, you know, I'm not in a position to question it, but those are eight-year-old numbers, to be very honest with you, and we can't fully understand the cost of nuclear energy until we legalise it. Because once, until we get the business plans in, until we get proposal, proposals, there's no way of knowing the true costs. Now, we, this clean energy transition is not as easy as I think a lot of politicians are making it out to be. There is huge, huge risks involved. And it's my firm belief that we need to have all options on the table in order to address it. And indeed, that includes nuclear energy. Nuclear energy, unlike fossil fuels, is clean. It's the cleanest, it has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions of any energy source. And it's safe. It's the second safest form of power generation. And compared to renewables, not only is it incredibly reliable, but it's also, and I think the most important thing is, it's a proven technology. No nation around the world, no major nation has been able to completely power itself from renewables. And I don't think we should have to take that risk. And you look at the alternative with nuclear energy. There are 32 countries around the world which have successfully used nuclear energy, such as France and the UAE, and they have shown evidence that nuclear energy lowers power bills, lowers emissions, and increases nations' energy security. And I think that's important. Now, in regard to the risk question, what I would ask, and I think this is a question for the government, is what is the backup? What is the redundancy? And what is the plan B if this renewable-centric approach fails is there's many credible experts who are saying, like A.D. Patterson and all of these under, other individuals, besides from dangerous and dirty fossil fuels like gas, which we know, according to the government's own reports, like the Net Zero Australia report, will be used for decades to come. I think that's a quite serious question and one that I think the government well, needs to answer. Now's your opportunity. <laughs> I do, I do applaud the passion with which you, you speak on this, Will, and, um, and the knowledge that you bring to this, you. to this topic as well, and I do recognise that. Um, you know, we banned, nuclear was banned in Australia just mm. as a way of background in the 1990s among, amid concerns about safety. Um, I think those concerns persist. I think that there are still concerns about safety and particularly around storage um, of nuclear. I also think that, and we've done the... the, um, the looking at this, that renewables are cheaper. We need something that um, that we're going to be able to transition to fairly quickly. Nuclear will take a much longer time and will be more expensive in order to do that. Australia is best positioned to take advantage of the um, of renewable energy, but we also have some really great minds in Australia working on renewable energy and working on storage of renewable energy, because I know you're going to say the sun don't always shine. <laughs> and, it, and you're right, the sun don't always shine, especially not in Melbourne. But, you know, the, the, um, we do have some of the best minds in the world in Australia working on renewables and All working right. on storage as well. I, what, what I would just mm -hmm. argue is even the government's own AEMO, the electricity market operator, is predicting that there's going to be shortfalls in dispatchable energy and that means the lights go out. I think we need to have all options on the table. And, you know, in regards to waste and safety, like I said, nuclear is the safe, second safest form of energy generation. A lot of that is overblown, I think. And in regards to spent fuel, we safely manage it. We've got and Stowe at Lucas Heights. It's 30 kilometres from the Sydney CBD and I've went um, recently and they store the waste there. You can stand next to it. There's no impact. You, you're not exposed to any excess radiation. In fact, you're exposed to less than actually being in the city. It's incredibly well managed and I think we've got the expertise in Australia. There's over 400 All right, PhDs. Will, I think we've got, to, we've got to move on a little bit from this support. I can see it. Please, Look, yeah. I, I am not staunchly decided either way about nuclear, I have to say. Um, you were a school strike I was for climate. a school strike for climate. Yeah, yes, activist. Right, yeah. Let's talk about that too. Yeah, yeah and I now uh, work for AYCC, Australian Youth Climate Coalition. Um, so I do a lot of that kind of grassroots protest organising side of the climate movement. Um, my issue with nuclear energy at this point in time is that it is 
not transitioning us away from the model that we've had for so long with energy, which is extractive. Uh, to create nuclear energy, you have to mine. Uh, we've, we have not seen it successfully Be done sorry, here. And also, we've seen many, many Indigenous land groups oppose it. And until those concerns are resolved in a good way, in a way where I don't think companies like uh, the likes of Rio Tinto Mm. can come in and take that, um, you know, lifting of the ban and use it uh, to destroy more sacred sites and extract more from the land in a way that isn't renewable, I'm not comfortable with it. The ban yeah, lifted. no, I get that. If I could very quickly respond to that. I think it's actually in many cases worse for renewables, and we need to be frank about that. Mine, mining regards to solar panels, there's 14 times more mining needed for solar panels. The companies like Rio Tinto, like, she like BP, whatever, they're the ones benefiting from this transition. Renewables does not mean it's clean. I'm, I'm not against renewables. I think new renewables are good and we should have more renewables and I think nuclear complements them. But even in regards to land, there's hundreds of times more land needed for... Um, renewable developments in regards to nuclear reactors. And that has an impact. That has an impact on Indigenous communities. That has an impact on farms. And there's been a huge push against that and also to our biological... Uh, sorry, our flora and fauna in Australia. So I don't think that's an issue unique to nuclear, to be very honest. And I think nuclear would actually improve... Uh, improve those sort of issues. Laura, you have campaigned for the Liberals. What's your take on this? Then? Um, I think there's growing support for um, nuclear amongst young people and um, Will's uh, Nuclear for Australia organisation um, demonstrates that perfectly. I think you're near 10,000 signatures um, now. Um, and there's also been... Um, the, both the Liberals and the Nationals are starting to advocate for the conversation re regarding uh, nuclear energy um, with both parties uh, really pushing it, uh, pu pushing for it within their conversations because there's obviously an energy crisis and, as Will said, we need to investigate um, all means available. Mm. Oh, and I can <laughs> see. Look, I, I have huge problems with nuclear. My problems are not the safety. Um, you know, I've, mm. I've looked at all your stats. Yeah. They're, they're pretty good. Um, my, <laughs> they are, they are. I, my, my problem is actually generally with the way that we use energy here, um, the way that it's completely unregulated and we have uh, energy companies have a huge stake in our democratic process, arguably more than a lot of people do. Uh, that's my main issue. Uh, also, I mean, we've seen uh, the court decision for uh, the nuclear storage in the Kimber in the last week. Uh, I, I just think if... if Indigenous land rights groups and uh, elders and traditional owners of the land are opposed to it. I'm opposed to it. Uh, it's it's their land. I, I can I, see I'm you aware that there's to Mali. Yeah. I'm behind it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm behind it. Yeah. How do you feel? Well, I mean, if you know, if mob and family don't want people like digging around, mucking up the land, then don't do it. <laughs> so that's all I've got. Yeah. <laughs> We had better move on. So now I'd like to bring in Beck Brown. Uh, hi, I'm Beck. Currently completing Year 12, and I play competitive sport, both netball and volleyball. With the cancellation of the Commonwealth Games in Victoria, what do you think it would look like for young athletes of the region, like myself, who aspire to play in these bigger sporting competitions? All right, I'm going to put this to Leo as the Victorian here. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think. Representing on the panel. Yeah. Represent, um, yeah. <laughs> I, look, it, it's obviously going to be tough, and especially knowing just how, um, how sudden this cancellation was. I mean, so many groups uh, didn't know about it, you know, did they? They um, found out as the press conference was, you know, had a 9.30 the other day from, from Dan Andrews. Um, it is going to be tough for young athletes, and I guess, uh, you know, there's so many um, levels of, of, of competition, um, but especially for those who might be even the most successful, who are trying to get into something even like the Olympics, and they are looking for something you know, on home soil, especially for like a rural athlete, maybe in the mm. in the areas that were supposed to host all these events, like Shepparton, and like Geelong, Ballarat, um, it, it's going to be tough for them. They're not going to have that. And even those who are too young, like you know, primary school age kids, who want to see um, professional athletes and young and up and coming athletes 
um, uh, uh, you know, near them and able to watch them, you know, they're not going to be able to see that if they're in those um, rural areas and we're really hoping for it. It's obviously a, you know, a huge debate regarding what's happened um, and, again, you know, mm. extremely sudden. Um, but it, it, you know, probably, you know, doesn't just help... It probably doesn't help those, those young athletes at all. Yeah. Laura? You're a monarchist, I believe. So how do you think this might impact our relationship with the rest of the Commonwealth? Well, I think the sudden cancellation is quite embarrassing for not only Dan Andrews but Australia because we've promised this Olympics um, and now it's cancelled and obviously that's going to impact particularly the regions of Victoria. I'm from New South Wales, but um, from my understanding, a lot of the events were going to be held in um, regional Vic uh, Victoria. Um, and with that comes new sporting facilities and tourism. Um, so I do feel bad. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of... Um, uh, sorry, uh, the monarchy? Yeah, the monarchy. OK. Um, well, as, as well should, we, should we be part of the Commonwealth in the first place, then? You know? Well, I think when it comes to the monarchy, we shouldn't fix something that's not broken. I think that the way that Australia's governor and governor-generals work is effective as it is, and I believe having an apolitical um, head figure is really effective in uh, doing the job, which is like signing the bills and um, more uh, so um, representing Australia internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think the job that the Governor General does uh, right now is quite effective. And uh, first the ashes, now this. Is this, a, is this an issue? Is it a bad look well, for I'm Australia? I'm sitting here going, if she's quiet, nobody will ask her about sport. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Beck, Beck, were you planning on... Are you, like, in, at that level of competition? Um, not so much, but I do have a lot of um, role models, especially mm. in the netball area, that I was really looking forward to watching. Mm, yeah. um, especially since... You know, netball and volleyball are really big parts of my life. Yeah. So I think personally, like what Leo said, actually seeing those professional athletes play in the home state that I'm in would have been so amazing. Yeah. And not only like playing, it would have been amazing, but definitely watching them on. It's a mm. big inspiration. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody think that the money uh, is well spent elsewhere? Does anybody have that opinion? Look, yeah. I, <laughs> if, it's, if it truly costs $7 <laughs> billion, dollars, and I think that's being contested at the moment, yeah. I think there probably are larger priorities, to be honest. That's not to say I think there's huge benefits that come out of the Commonwealth Games and, indeed, all other events. Even I'm from Brisbane. We've got the Brisbane 2032 Olympics coming up and... I mean, that's going to cost a lot. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> and I think there probably should be some savings on some things, but it's great that the government, mm. the state and federal government are supporting that. Mm. And I think the true importance of these events, not only for the athletes, but it's also the legacy and what yeah. they're able to create for those host locations. And you could just imagine what, how it, the, the Commonwealth Games would have impacted regional Victoria and all the opportunities that would have been created out of it. I think it's a real shame that it's been lost and hopefully we can find a compromise and a solution can be found so that the 2026 Commonwealth Games mm -hmm. can be hosted and those athletes can... Yeah ultimately show I, off their abilities to the world. I hate to take up more time and be as quick as yeah. I can and Thanks, I risk a slightly terrible um, comparison here. But I do... I, it is a large sum of money. Mm. And if we also are questioning the cost of putting on the referendum, which is close to half a billion dollars, and then we're talking about something which maybe is up to six billion dollars... Um, I, I mean, I'm not contesting the fact that there are athletes who were going to be part of this and that's, you know, it's something to be reckoned with and, and hopefully there is something that, that can be figured out. Um, I do find that the Commonwealth Games are tokenistic. Uh, they're, a, they're a way of pandering to the idea that we are kind of a united Commonwealth, we're all fair and equal when it's mm -hmm. just not the case practically. <laughs> it, can, it can go elsewhere. <laughs> All right, uh, now we can bring you the result of our online poll. We asked you, school students, should mobile phones be banned in all high schools? Oh. Almost 1,500 wow. of you responded. That's a lot of people think that. Here's how you voted. 61% of you say yes, 32% say no, and 7% wow. unsure. Interesting. It is it's possible adults got involved in that. We can't. <laughs> 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 and to finish tonight's discussion, we have a question from Philip Habib. Um, hi. Uh, so for all the youth panel members, what's your best advice for youth around Australia looking to make a political impact? 
Okay, Luke, we've got to be pretty quick with this one, but I'm <laughs> going to put it to Laura. Yeah. What do I'd you say, think? What's I'd your say advice? just get involved. Um, if you have a certain political leaning, um, join a party. There's a lot of networks there. Um, create an organisation. We've obviously got Will and Leo here who have um, created respective organisations and that would make a huge impact. Let's hear from everyone. Amali, what do you think? Um, speak on what you're passionate about. I think just like give everything a crack and you know what you believe to be true, put it out there, let it like make it known and just do what you can to get involved to help what you want to happen. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to start up something, if you, if you want to start up uh, an organisation, if you want to get involved, I mean, why isn't it possible? You can absolutely go ahead and do that and it's really important, especially if we're, you know, 16, 17 year olds and under, we're not able to vote. That's um, one step you can take. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to know that like no one is apolitical, like no human being, because it p plays an integral role in all of our lives, politics, uh, and it's not something that just happens in Canberra or in your you know state parliament. I think get involved in any way you can, join an organisation, join a party, join a grassroots organisation, uh, start a social media account if you want. There's so many ways to get involved, um, and and you know it's about your life, like that's why it's important. And Will. I'll give, you, I'll give you three words and it's have a go. That's, it. That's what I would say to any young person, just have a go. And I think as we've all been able to demonstrate, and a lot of young people have been able to as well, that it's paid off. Lovely. And Anne, you're already a politician. We've heard enough from you. So. <laughs> <laughs> what they said. No, thank you so much. That's all we have time for. A big thank you to our panel, Amali Braun, Leo Puglisi, Aud Mason Hyde, Will Shackle, Laura Strawbridge and Anne Ali. Thank you all for sharing your stories and questions. On Monday, Patricia Carvelis will be back with you live from Melbourne. On the panel, UK Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, filmmaker Rachel Perkins and independent member for Curtin, Kate Cheney. Head to the Q&A website to register to be in the audience. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night.